Wyoming's wildlife laws and regulations exist to balance wildlife numbers with the state's habitat. Poaching throws this system out of balance, and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department's law enforcement personnel are committed to nabbing those who disobey our game laws and disrespect our wildlife. Catching the bad guys, this week on Wyoming Wildlife TV. Enforcement of wildlife laws and regulations is a top priority of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Have a good trip. Thanks. I think it's important uh, that we enforce wildlife laws and regulations to, uh, to give the wildlife some protection. Years ago, elk were almost completely wiped out in our bison, and we've got a number of animals on the endangered species list today that uh, is being protected, and without that protection, without us enforcing those laws and regulations, uh, we'd have a lot fewer wildlife to, you know, for folks to hunt and, and to view. The rich history of wildlife law enforcement in Wyoming spans more than a century. In the late 1890s, most of the wildlife, particularly big game and large predators, had been virtually wiped out or extirpated in Wyoming and in many areas of the West. Uh, there was a former Texas Ranger named D.C. Nowlin, who had come through Wyoming on one of the last big cattle drives from Texas to Montana with 4,100 head of Longhorn cattle. He liked Wyoming. He had hunted here, uh, bison, when he came through. And he decided he wanted to return to Wyoming. And when he returned in the late 1890s, he was just appalled at how the big game, particularly, and other forms of wildlife were being lost. Almost all the bison had been killed except a handful in Yellowstone Park that were being guarded by the Army. Uh, most of the elk were gone from mountain ranges outside of Yellowstone. Uh, the antelope were down to just a handful. Uh, so he ran for the 1899 Wyoming Legislature, the fifth Wyoming Legislature, and was elected. And he ran with the sole purpose of creating a Wildlife Protection Act, which he authored. He got that passed, and that act created the position of state game warden, which is basically what I hold today. He was a, a, a very clever manager uh, of both people and wildlife. He obtained some appropriations. He got the uh, statutory ability to appoint deputies and to also deputize forest rangers, folks like that, to get some assistance. And he began to turn the tide against this unregulated hunting. He'd ride 1,000 to 1,500 miles horseback every fall looking at the conditions of the wildlife. Um, he was a pioneer in wildlife restoration. In 1910, he uh, orchestrated the first capture of elk in Jackson Hole. Uh, after Nowlin, uh, left his position, he had created this tradition of, of proper wildlife management and restoration. And his successors uh, continued many of those programs. The game, early game wardens, you want to remember this, before there was an actual wildlife department or a commission, but they took it on themselves to capture and translocate many uh, animals and birds which, were, which had been just all, virtually wiped out. Uh, the beaver were absent from many of the streams. It's hard to imagine today with the abundant populations. But these early game wardens, doing a lot of it on horseback, captured several thousand beaver and relocated them, often building speci special pack saddles to carry them, learned how to handle them without injury. Uh, they restored uh, mule deer to areas that had been wiped out. The era of the uh, 1930s, uh, late 1920s, the 1930s, pre-World War II was uh, uh, somewhat of an interesting era because there were very limited resources, just a handful of game wardens, uh, but they 
uh, we're still able to maintain the wildlife populations that we, that we, that we see today. Uh, game wardens in the early years focused on just a few major areas. In the early years, it was direct wildlife protection. The wildlife was basically wiped out in many areas, so every animal counted. There, you see old photographs of, of a game warden snowshoeing in with a single bale of hay to a one or two elk stranded somewhere, because one or two elk were extremely valuable, because they, they didn't have many. Uh, so wildlife protection was the emphasis. Wildlife restoration was added. But up through World War II, that was the emphasis. Today, a, a game warden probably has, he has more complexity in his work, but the game warden's uh, role has not changed significantly. He is out in the field for the most part. He is ambassador for the agency, first line contact for most of the public, including the landowners in the state. We've made a conscious effort to keep uh, that job in, in its original form as much as possible. And I think we've uh, succeeded, and I think that's a reason that they're successful. How's it been going? And well thought of. On patrol with the Wyoming Game and Fish Warden when we return. It's actually on every single one. The job of the Wyoming Game and Fish Warden is a challenging but necessary one. And this profession comes with a variety of duties. The Wyoming Game Warden has a multitude of duties and uh, they range anywhere from uh, helping the biologists set seasons, enforcing the laws and regulations of the state. Uh, we deal a lot with damage. Wyoming is uh, liable for paying damages to, to crops from from big game and trophy game animals. We teach hunter safety courses and we meet with a wide range of publics and federal agencies. This morning uh, we went out in Antelope Area 88 and uh, what we try to do is patrol the area with our patrol vehicles as well as set up a check station. We try to set up a check station at a strategically located area where we can catch most of the traffic. Our wardens are out in the field um, looking for compliance okay. with wildlife Thanks. laws and regulations. Jackson, huh? If the check station personnel Yellow. need any help for law enforcement, they'll call us on the radio. We try to stay pretty close by, but we just try to contact as many hunters as we can in the field, and uh, I think it's a good PR thing as well to visit with those hunters, and, and uh, this we hope that, that everybody has a pleasant experience when they're out there. The most common violation that we deal with is probably uh, fail to tag, fail to properly tag their animal after they shoot it. They've got to detach the carcass coupon, fill out the dates. Uh, we get a lot of folks that uh, don't fill them out, don't properly fill them out. Uh, trespass is a big one. People trespassing to hunt or fish on private property without permission. Do you have your conservation stamp? We require you to have a conservation stamp uh, and an elk management stamp, and you need to have a hunter safety card if you're born well, after you January 1966. Stamps, yeah. Those are a lot of things that come up on a, on a daily basis. Well, you guys enjoy your day. A well-rounded right. game warden okay. needs uh, a multiple of yep. skills, whether it be horse packing skills, ATV skills, uh, the ability to operate a four-wheel drive vehicle and put on chains and, and be out in the, the deep snow and the slick roads. Some of the biggest skills that our wardens need to have is interpersonal skills to uh, deal with the public and to be able to deal with any given situation at any given time. And uh, there's just such a broad range of things that could come up in a single day's work with the game and fish. You might be checking hunters one minute and, and darting a black bear or a moose the next minute or, or dealing with a, a violent hunter in the next camp, you know. So there's just a lot of skills that, that one should have. And I think some of our better game wardens just grew up hunting and fishing and they have really good people skills and deal well with the public. Actually, they ran right behind you. No way. Yeah. One of the kind of side benefits of this position that we that was created in the earliest years and maintained for decades is that we're able to attract uh, extremely high quality 
personnel to these jobs. They're a job that is, is, is it's a job that's very sought after because uh, we, we look for people who have a biological background and then we teach them to do law enforcement. And so uh, we're, we're very proud of the caliber of, of game wardens that we have today. Patrolling the back country presents its own challenges and right, traditionally right has been done on horseback. Right. There's a lot of outfitted hunts. We have a lot of outfitter, outfitters uh, working in this area. They provide hunts for the hunters from different parts of the country. So what we like to do is drop in on, on, on these outfitters, uh, check their hunters, uh, check for compliance, license compliance, make sure they have all their paperwork, and then get with the outfitter. I think the other thing is, is really, again, to get with the outfitter, find out uh, what's going on in camp, what problems they're having. Again, grizzly bears are such a big, a big issue in this part of the state that uh, I, I really want to know uh, if they're having any problems. If, they've, uh, if they have harvested any game, we want to check the game. And uh, if they uh, find out if they had any trouble when retrieving that carcass, if a bear got on it, if they had problems that way, if they're having bears in camp. Exactly. We'll even ask them if they're having problems with a hunter. You know, if, if some hunter's giving them a bad time or big, giving one of their guides a bad time, we'll talk to the hunter and, and let them know that we're present and, and that uh, you know we're very active in the area. If they have the temptation to violate the game of fish law. Our, our presence back there, I think, does, does a lot to prevent. Right. It's important that people realize that the you know the arm of the law is going to extend beyond the highway, beyond the the, the uh, two wheel track or the four wheeler track. We have just a lot of wilderness in this part of Wyoming. It's been uh, patrolled by, by our officers, uh, and it's, it's certainly a tradition in, in Wyoming Game of Fish to do it. Now, have you been here before? It's the same thing that we're looking for in the back country. We're looking at checking for compliance. We're um, checking to make sure that uh, you know, the hunters have the proper licenses. Hunters, if they harvest game, um, have re recovered all that the meat and uh, are going to bring it back uh, to camp with them and not leave anything. And so, you know, it, it's the same thing, it, it's just at, 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 a, at a slower pace. It's important that we're back there and become a part of, of what's going on in the backcountry. Uh, that we have to camp where they camp, that we have to deal with the problems they deal with. It helps us with our, with our management, and, and too, we know what the game's doing. Um, we know uh, from talking to them uh, what they're seeing for, for uh, bears, what they're seeing for problems, what they're seeing for wildlife. Training is the key when it comes to things in the backcountry. Uh, backcountry survival, you know, I mean, you can have a lot of these skills, but you've really got to go to take a lot of training in backcountry survival because those are the things that, that, that you're going to need to know. And to not only to recognize symptoms with yourself, but you're going to be called on by people in the backcountry um, that are injured, and you're going to have to, to um, provide first aid for them. You, you'd have to really be out of your mind to, to violate Wyoming Game and Fish laws because you just have so much to lose. To have your presence there, it just shows how, how important it is that it means a lot to, for people to see you there. <laughs> the role forensic science plays in solving wildlife crimes when Wyoming Wildlife TV returns. Wyoming Game and Fish Department relies on forensics to solve some wildlife violation cases. We're fortunate in that we have a state-of-the-art wildlife forensic lab. We can do everything from DNA work, uh, matching up things like maybe a headless carcass with, a, with, a, with the head of an animal we find later, maybe in a trophy status, or uh, maybe a package of meat we find, we seize from a freezer as evidence, we can, we can match those. We receive uh, evidentiary items from law enforcement officials in the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and five other states. When that evidence is received in the laboratory, we assign it a unique lab number here. And that lab number follows the sample throughout the te testing process. We use uh, wildlife forensics to catch a poacher by the game wardens will actually send us the sample 
um, through the mail or they'll actually hand deliver it. There are a few instances where we'll go to the field and we will assist with the collection of the samples, but that is rare. There's just not enough hours in the day to be able to do that. So they send us the samples here. Um, we then analyze it going through the species ID, the gender, um, and the matching, the genotyping. Then we send a report back to the submitting officer that details all the work, all the evidence that we received, all the testing that we did, and then the results of those analysis and the conclusions from those results. If the samples match, if they don't match, if there's four animals present, if there's five and what species they are and that type of thing. The game warden then uses that in some instances to actually prosecute the, the individual or in, in other instances they can use it to get a search warrant to go in and find more evidence um, of the crime of the poaching or additional poaching incidences. We get evidence in unbelievable shapes and forms. Um, we often get knives and we swab the blood off of it. So in that instance, we're still using a blood sample, but we, the evidence that we received was a knife. We get beer cans, we get tissue samples from knives, from freezers, from you know small pieces attached to clothing. Um, we get a lot of clothing, hunting clothing that was used and, and we will um, cut out the blood spot or we'll pick off a little bit of flesh. Anything you can think of probably we have seen here. Whole carcasses, you know, partial carcasses, antlers, horns, and any of those things can be used for a DNA analysis in one form or another. All of my teams here are really good and we, we do really good work together. They're a big part of why this lab works as well as it does. Probably the most prevalent misconception is the time factor that's involved with this analysis. Um, I think a lot of that is probably from the fictional TV shows where they add two chemicals together and they throw it in the machine and they walk to the end of the bench and they pull off the results. That's just not the case. Um, it takes quite a bit of time to do each one of the cases. Everything is handled separately and individually, you know, and, and great care is taken with every case because we do have the possibility of sending somebody to jail or costing them their livelihood, and we don't take that responsibility lightly. So it takes, it takes a lot longer to do these analysis than one would think. And the other thing is that um, on TV, almost every sample works almost every time, and every case has something really unique. Well, if every case had something really unique, then it wouldn't be unique. So the, the, there is um, forensic evidence is often trace evidence, so it's often degraded, it's often small, and there are probably 8 to 10, maybe 15 percent of our samples that just will never work for forensic analysis. And hopefully those aren't the most critical parts of their case, but in some instances there are. Sometimes we just can't make a case because the evidence is too degraded or the sample size is just too small for us to work with. Recent advances in forensics have made this science more effective in solving wildlife crimes. There is this new technique. It's a new um, spot in mitochondrial DNA that people are sequencing. It's called uh, CO1. It's the barcode of life. And people all over the world are using this um, technology and they are putting it in a database that anybody can access. And what it's going to allow is species identification of anything at, at, you know, at your fingertips after you do the, the sequencing of, of the DNA. You'll be able to plug that sequence into this barcode of life and be able to tell exactly what it is. Um, in some instances, you'll even be able to tell hybrids and that type of thing. You know, our main job with helping out the game warden is to try and link the suspect, you know, to the crime scene um, back to the carcass or, or the victim in this case, which would be the animal. So, you know, it's kind of a puzzle and, and the thing that's really great about this job is like every puzzle is different. You know, we never have the same thing on a day-to-day -day basis. In some cases, we actually exonerate the suspect or we confirm that what the suspect is telling is actually the truth. So there are, I wouldn't say a lot of instances, but there are four or five cases every year where we determine the suspect is actually telling the truth. We don't always find the bad guy guilty. Sometimes they're not bad guys. The history and present status of compliance with wildlife regulations when we return.
The degree of compliance with wildlife laws has changed over the years due to a you know, number of factors. How many people don't have life jackets? You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you'll be out there in the field checking hunters one day, and uh, everybody you come across has done about everything wrong. And then you might be out there for a week or two and come across very few violations, if any. If you were to look at the, the history of compliance with uh, game and fish laws and regulations, the violation rate is lower than it was years ago. I seem to see fewer people uh, shooting over limits of animals. Years ago, folks were, were after it for the meat and feed their family, and there was a lot of party hunting going on, a lot of transfer of license. Today, you see most of your fishermen releasing the fish. Um, you see a great deal of your hunters out there hunting for a trophy rather than the meat. Wyoming tends to value their wildlife uh, very highly, and our fines are going up for people who violate the law. Well, most poaching cases are a single incident. There have been cases of organized poaching rings that have been brought down by the Game and Fish Department. One of the things that we've found through time is that the type of violator we're dealing with has uh, evolved or changed significantly. It used to be mostly uh, illegal big game hunters that we were, that we were dealing with, or maybe fishermen. But now we're entering into an era where we deal with things like license fraud, uh, people trying to obtain uh, hunting licenses uh, through fraudulent means, counterfeiting of licenses. These are very detailed investigations, and I'm not talking about a rare incident. This is something we're dealing with every year. We have, in recent years, dealt with what I would call almost a serial wildlife killer personality that's, that, that, that we've, we've discovered. People who are out killing hundreds of animals, many of them older age class, trophy class animals, taking a lot away from the wildlife resource, taking a lot away from the, from the, the people of Wyoming, um, and taking some of the best, uh, the best animals out of our population. Some of them fit the stereotype one might have of a, of a criminal. So there's some of them that are, that, are, that are really part of the criminal element, and they have the criminal history to go with that. Some of the others are committing numerous serious wildlife violations, but, they, but to meet them, you would think they were some professional sort of person. They've, in fact, they may develop a real facade, but in reality, they're out there killing animals. You know, the extent to which some of these people will go to kill these animals is absolutely amazing. And uh, we're just constantly having, having to adapt, having to develop new techniques, you know, buy the latest equipment, whatever it might take, uh, to, uh, to basically capture these individuals and get them prosecuted. In that sense, it's a new era, and we have to have the capability to do the forensic work, to have investigators focus on these long-term investigations. Some of these might take several years to unravel. Uh, we do feel that our uh, forensic capability is one of the things that is, that is really allowing us to keep pace with this rapidly evolving criminal element uh, harming the wildlife resource. There's, there's many interesting examples that, that come to mind where we find uh, you know, parts of animals, we preserve that DNA, later we, we find the rest of that animal in the possession of this person. It might even be several years later. It's, it's, it's uh, analogous to what you would, you would see on TV with uh, all the forensic uh, programming that you see uh, uh, regard to, to crimes against people or property, but in this case, it's a crime against wildlife. Wildlife belongs to all the people of Wyoming. The Game and Fish Department is committed to ensuring that those few criminals that disrespect wildlife laws are brought to justice. All right. All right. Have a good Have trip. Good one, Thanks. Thanks.